I was born in Turkey to a secular Muslim family. I grew up as a secular Muslim. I was not interested in any religion. I wasn't interested in Islam. I wasn't interested in any other religion. When I say secular Muslim, what I mean is actually in all practical sense, absolutely godless, but only in name, Muslim. Never will go to mosque, never will partake in any religious event, godless in every sense. I wasn't just, I wasn't the only one living that way, my whole society lived that way. My parents, my community, my schools, my, my, my classmates, that was the way of life for us. In 2001, after I have completed my military service in the Turkish army, I encountered with Jesus. In fact, shall I rather say, I encountered the Holy Spirit. I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't looking for any religion. I was a young man just out of the military service. Having done the military service, I had the confidence and I had the conviction that I can conquer the whole world. I can do pretty much anything. I survived the army and I was a sergeant in the army. I was commanding 320 soldiers. Now I can command the world. That's, that's the perspective I had. But God had a different plan. One day, I am not exaggerating, one day I started hearing a voice, a mysterious voice that I never heard before. Nobody is around me, but I hear the voice, and the voice tells me, read the book Christians read and believe in the God Christians worship at the church. I immediately understood this meant becoming Christian. And I was not interested in any religion. Uh, to say the least, I was not interested in Christianity at all. So I decided I'm going to ignore this voice. But this voice was more persistent than me. This voice kept repeating. This voice kept repeating approximately three weeks. It was daytime, it was nighttime. I will hear the same phrase. Read the book Christians read at the church. Believe in the God Christians worship at the church. Now this thing completely singled out the God of Christians as the God of the book that Christians read, and also God that Christians worship at the church, meaning that it's different than all other gods. It's identical. You can separate him away from other gods. Eventually, at the end of those three weeks' time, I decided I'm either going to go insane with this voice, or I'm going to do something to stop the voice. But still, I was nowhere interested in believing the God of the Bible. With that intention, I thought, if I do a trick to this Christian God, maybe he will leave me alone. What if I take a Christian book? By that time, I did not know the name of the book. Today I know it's called Bible. I thought to myself, what if I take that Christian book in my hand, sit down and pretend that I'm reading? Then this voice that keeps speaking to me, will see that I am reading the Christian book and he will leave me alone and he will go away. So, that was the plan. I knew some Christian people. I went to them and I, I asked them if they could borrow me the book that they read at the church. They said, what book I read at the church? What book do you guys read at the church? There must be a book that you read. Oh, the Bible, yeah. Can you borrow it to me? Or can you lend it to me? He said, fine. They gave me a book. They gave me the Bible. First time in my hand I'm holding the Bible. And I went home and I started executing my plan, my great plan of silencing the God of the Christians so that he will leave me alone and I will carry on in my ways. Like Frank Sinatra said, my way. I want to do my way. And I went home and I did that. I looked at the book here and there, and I thought this Christian book is not, not really my cup of tea. Christian God is not really my cup of tea. 
Long story short, I am now jump, jumping over, skipping over the details. I was not at all close to him. I closed the book and I returned it back to them. As I returned the book, I said, you know, this Christian book is actually a silly book. It's all about the genealogy of this and genealogy of that because people told me to read the book of Matthew. I started there. And I thought, this is just a silly genealogy of some people who has nothing to do with me. Then I told them, I am sure the Muslim book has more value to read than the Christian book. At least Muslim book will tell me probably, because I actually never read the Quran either. But I was telling them. <laughs> I said, probably the Muslim book will tell me, this is good, do this, and this is not good, don't do this. Then they said, oh, you, you want such material? Okay, we have that also in the Bible. They opened the Bible and put the bookmark, and they gave it back into my hand. And I ended up with the Bible in my hand one more day. I went home, and I opened that place. It was the book of Proverbs. I loved it. I loved it. Without realizing, I read all the way to chapter 5. When I came to chapter 5, my whole world collapsed. The entire foundation upon which I stood completely was demolished when I read chapter 5. Do you know what is chapter 5 of Proverbs talking about? Man being faithful to his wife. When I read that, it just did not fit into my worldview. Instead, it completely demolished my entire foundation. As a Mediterranean Turkish, we don't have anything called faithfulness between husband and wife. People sleep around. Men sleep around. But to, for men to sleep around, he needs some woman to sleep around. So men and women all sleep around. My dad was married and divorced multiple times. I had not had met my mom by that time. Did you know? I met my real mother only when I was 30 years old for the first time. Because they slept around, they divorced, and they moved on, like everyone else does. Now I was reading chapter 5 of Proverbs, where God says to a man to be faithful to his wife, which comes against the world in which I grew up, which says, we come to this world once, we just enjoy every flower we see. That's exactly how I lived, how I grew up. That moment I fell on the floor. Immediately a supernatural understanding came on my head. If that is the standard of the God of this book, which is above every standard I know, he must indeed be God. And if he is indeed God, and if I have only two brain cells, I better fall down before him on my knees. That was the moment I encountered God for the first time. And after that moment, I was never the same again. I fell on the floor and I said to God, Now I understand. You are the God of heavens and the earth, and your wisdom is way above our wisdom. And for the rest of my life, I shall worship you and I shall serve you. And that's exactly what happened. I didn't know all the details that I know today. I didn't, in fact, even know at that time that if I believe in Jesus, I will go to heaven. I didn't know that. I only knew one thing. The God of this book is the God above all. He's the most superior. And any human being with two brain cells should bow down to him. If you don't bow down to him, that's the greatest stupidity you can display. <laughs> Not bowing down to God of heaven and earth, God of the Bible, is the greatest stupidity man can display in his lifetime. I'm telling you, there is no greater stupidity than that. Because he is the God of heaven and earth, he can destroy you just like that. He can make you vanity of vanities just like that. Or he can take the shepherd and make him the king, the most glorious king in the entire human history. 
He's the God of heaven and earth. He's the one who created you. He knows your most inner parts. He knows your past, your present, and your future. If you take him against you, that is the greatest stupidity you can display. And the greatest wisdom is to go and take shelter under his wings. That was the wisdom God just showed me, God just gave me that night. And as a result of that, I said, I bow down to you. Not because I was any, any better than anyone else, but God showed me. He is the God of all. He is the superior, the most superior. You are either going to be behind him, under his shadow, under his wings, or you're going to stand in front of him, and he's going to demolish you if he wants to. In South Africa and in the Western world largely, people put a lot of emphasis on the love and grace and mercy of God. But people are scared to talk about the wrath of God, which is being displayed in front of our eyes every day. I gave my life to God of the Bible, God of the Jews, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the father of Jesus, on that night on the floor next to my bed because I read Proverbs chapter 5. But more than that, because the Holy Spirit has been talking to me, evangelizing me in his unique ways and downloading into my heart wisdom from above, wisdom from God that I could have never ever learned from any book. That God is this most superior you better bow down to him. After that, I was a new man. Of course, change doesn't happen just like that. But change happens with a decision. I made a decision that night. It took about a month after that to join a congregation in Turkey. Soon after I joined, I told the pastor, okay, what's next? Now I'm a believer, what's next? There must be something more. I'm not just going to sit in the pew and get old in this pew until I die. What's next? I promise to this God I will worship and I will serve him. How do I serve him? In that church, I got discipled. I got trained. I got baptized. Eventually, about eight years later from that church, I was launched out to South Africa to start this ministry. Our ministry is called Countdown to Christ Ministries. I'm the founder and director of this ministry. And the objective is to preach in the gospel of Jesus Christ with an emphasis on his soon return. I'm married to a beautiful, lovely Afrikaans lady. I'm, I'm extremely blessed that God blessed me with my wife. I, was, I would have never been able to find her if, it got, if God didn't bring her to me in a miraculous way. God blessed us with three beautiful children. And that is my testimony in a nutshell. But when you become a believer, you're a baby in faith. You understand very little, and you know very little. What will set you apart from the rest of the world is, like today we have heard, we have sang in those songs, this determination to bless the name of God and trust the name of God. Trust the word of God. And you walk that journey with God, even if it doesn't make sense to you. It didn't make sense to me when God called me to South Africa. Everyone that I knew in Turkey told me that, have I gone insane? Why do I go to Africa, to the God's forsaken continent? I'm not exaggerating. That's what people told me. You might come to South Africa for tourism, but you don't want to move here, man. Are you mad? But God was calling me here. In fact, I got a very good offer from a church in Washington, D.C. to join, to, to rent and work, to go and work there and to settle down there. Just about the time I was called to South Africa. And I was so eager to go to Washington, D.C. rather than South Africa. In fact, I went there. And the next morning, my first morning, I woke up in that flat in Washington, D.C. From my window, I look at straight to White House. And the Holy Spirit told me, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> I am not exaggerating. Shattering all my excitement. 
few months later, the Holy Spirit told me, go back to South Africa. I said, no, they stole my luggage there. <laughs> Those people are chronic thieves. <laughs> that had happened. I, had, I was in South Africa before I went to D.C., and indeed, they stole my whole luggage, which I, I never ever could have imagined in my life before. Why would somebody steal someone else's luggage? It's just clothes in there. But they did. And God sent me here anyway. It's been a humpty dumpty journey so far. <laughs> Quite a bumpy road. But I learned another important lesson. You can live in the rest of the world without God, maybe, but not in South Africa. <laughs> you cannot live here without faith in God. If you try, you are just going to go insane, or you're going to become corrupt like everyone else. <laughs> God has been gracious to me beyond my imagination. Our ministry grew beyond my imagination also. In fact, when I say beyond my imagination, I'm not only talking about the physical and humanly measurable blessings, but also I'm talking about the secrets of God that God has been showing, teaching. The journey of maturing from being a baby in faith to becoming a mature man in faith. I'm not there yet, but I'm on that journey, like every one of you. I hope every one of you are on that journey. And that is beyond our imagination. We don't know what next God is going to do with us, what next God is going to teach, what next level of from glory to glory that Apostle Paul is talking about. Mm -hmm.